Celebrating 42 seasons on the air, Farm Week is a production of Mississippi State University Extension. Today on Farm Week, looking back on the deadliest wildfire season in a hundred years, how do you manage the forest to prevent such a catastrophe? For all the eating we do this time of year, how about them apples? We'll explain. And speaking of eating, a nutty story for you. Time to get cracking. And these aren't your everyday Christmas trees, at least not on this tree farm. Merry Christmas. Farm Week starts right now. Hello everyone, I'm Leighton Spann. And I'm Mike Russell. Merry Christmas. Thanks for joining us today on Farm Week. And by the way, today marks 2100 Farm Week shows since we began on the air October 3rd, 1977. With Christmas near, we're mindful of trees. Part of the Farm Bill contains a forestry provision that pays for, among other things, reducing the fuel that threatens towns, local industries, and lives. How do you manage a forest to ease firefighting? Should you? Here's Colleen Bradford Krantz. 8,500 firefighters from around the country worked in December of 2017 to battle Southern California's now infamous Thomas Fire. The blaze devastated nearly 282,000 acres to become the state's largest wildfire in modern history. Talbot Hayes, a Forest Service District Fire Management Officer from Alpine, California, traveled 200 miles north to join those battling the massive fire, which ultimately destroyed more than 1,000 homes and businesses, as well as taking two lives. A month later, Hayes returned home and continued his forest management work to simplify battling wildfires in his assigned district inside the Cleveland National Forest. The time to fight tomorrow's fire is in the winter through prescribed burning and fuels management practices. The almost automatic response to wildfires for decades had been to put them out immediately. Greater awareness of the positive and rejuvenating effects of natural fires in forest and prairie regions brought about a shift in strategies to allow fires in more remote areas of the country to burn longer. But in heavily populated regions where lives and buildings are at risk, Hayes says there are few such opportunities to just let it burn. Well, down here in Southern California, um, the strategies pretty much stayed, stayed the same and we try to suppress all fires due to the values at risk. The amount of people that live down here, the infrastructure in the area, uh, doesn't allow to uh, try to manage a fire, it's more full suppression. There are other regions that have a lot more wilderness and areas that are uh, further away from values at risk, communities, and uh, those areas can have slightly different strategies. The 2018 fire season is expected to be a tough one, as many regions are already tinder dry. New Mexico and Colorado have already faced large catastrophic wildfires that broke out before the traditional start of the fire season. We had engines that were sent to Colorado in March this year, which is very uncommon for Colorado to be having fires in March. We're not getting as much rain as we're used to getting. We're in a dry spell. Um, our local mountains aren't getting near the snowpack that they used to receive. And so the vegetation is, is a lot drier. Uh, the reservoirs don't have as much water. All this contributes to a, a busier, longer, more devastating fire season. According to Hayes, most wildfires in Southern California are started by humans rather than by lightning. A spark from a dragging trailer chain or a mower hitting a rock may start a grass fire in the heat of summer. Safe. Jay Eyre, Cleveland National Forest campground host at mile 26 on the Pacific Crest Trail, says hikers need to be aware of fire conditions and comply with fire prevention rules along the route. Campfires are prohibited outside designated campgrounds and permits are required to use certain types of camp stoves along the 2,659 mile trail that runs from Mexico to just over the Canadian border. They need to stop immediately if there's, a, if there's fire in the area. 
Ayer, a retired school teacher from Montana, says his home state also had a rough fire season last year. Last year was a big fire in, in western Montana mainly. A lot of Montana is uh, in high fire danger just because of the climate change and the warm temperatures, the lower snow levels we're seeing. And a few years ago there was a huge infest of bark beetles, that, so there's a lot of dead and down trees that are creating a lot of fuel to burn in Montana. It's those kind of dead and downed trees, as well as forest undergrowth, that are particularly concerning for Hayes and his crews. Their answer is to cut and mow underbrush, create fire breaks, and use prescribed burns in certain high-risk areas. We try to treat between four and 5,000 acres every winter through fuels management. Good fires do prevent bad fires. Community defense breaks are typically 300-foot wide bands that create a barrier between the national forest and communities on its edge. It takes a crew of 20 several days to cut and gather the brush in these defense breaks. But Hayes says it increases the odds for successfully protecting a town if a wildfire reaches the area. We try to cut out a lot of the vegetation, especially the dead vegetation and the more flammable vegetation, and in order to just reduce the intensity of the fire as it comes into the fuel break area to give us a better chance of actually stopping the fire. The locations for prescribed burns are selected based on how much wood and vegetation, aka fuel, is present, as well as how long the area has gone without a fire. The hope is that taking away a portion of the fuel will reduce the intensity of any wildfires that do occur. This side of the, the hand line that we're standing on has never been treated. It's never been uh, prescribed burned or thinned in any way. And you can see the, the heavy accumulation of ground fuels. And you can see how devastating a wildfire in the summer would be if it were to start in this area. Now this side over here, um, this area was thinned, um, it was broadcast burned. If there were to be a wildfire start in this area, the fire would be very low intensity. Um, we'd be able to get in here and, and keep the fire smaller. The federal government reported it spent a record $2.9 billion on suppressing fires in 2017. And the outlook for the current year is bleak, as many regions are expected to become dangerously dry. Firefighters will continue their work to reduce the size of the fires that will inevitably happen this year. It's not if, it's when we get the next fire. For Market to Market, I'm Colleen Bradford Krantz. And speaking of those trees, in this week's Southern Gardening segment, Gary Bachman tells us how an annual trip to the Christmas tree farm can become a great tradition. While growing up in Michigan, one of my favorite Christmas memories was going out to the farm to pick out the tree to bring home. Down here in Mississippi, many families have a similar tradition. Today I'm at Tom Lee's Christmas Tree Farm in Hattiesburg getting ready for the holiday season. The Tom Lee family has been growing Christmas trees since 1967. There are three varieties of trees being grown here that have adapted to our southern growing conditions. Leyland cypress is one of the most popular Christmas trees grown in the south. The foliage of Leyland cypress varies, but generally is arranged in irregular flat planes with a dark green to gray coloration. Virginia pine has been a workhorse for southern Christmas tree growers for many years. The short needles are arranged in pairs and add interest with their twisted structure. Consistent pruning results in tight branching. Carolina Sapphire is an improved selection of Arizona Cypress. The gray-green leaves are plentiful and arranged close to the stems and appear scale-like. This tree is aromatic with a scent of combined lemon and mint. A Christmas tree farm is no different than any other farm. Each year, the Tomleys plant at least a thousand transplants for future years. As these trees grow, careful pruning transforms the trees into the familiar pyramidal Christmas tree shape. It usually takes at least five years of shaping and pruning to turn a scrawny transplant into a glorious family Christmas tree. 
You too can create wonderful family memories of that annual trip to cut your own Christmas tree. I'm horticulturist Gary Bachman for Southern Gardening. Apple pie is a big treat at Christmas. It's believed there are more than 7,500 apple varieties. Some of them for cooking, some for cider, and some for afternoon snacks. Nonetheless, apple growers are looking for the next big thing and may have found it. Peter Tubbs takes us right to the core. 200 apple growers and industry representatives have come to a field day in Prosser, Washington to get a glimpse of an apple most have already committed to growing processing and distributing. Its hybrid name is WA38, but the public will know it as Cosmic Crisp. That apple is extremely grower friendly. It sets itself up well in the tree uh, on either uh, spindle, wall trellis, V trellis, what have you. It's going to be uh, way easier than, to deal with than the Honey Crisp and a way better keeper. The rollout of Cosmic Crisp is a first for the apple industry in that it mimics the introduction of many packaged foods. Apples are introduced to growers every year by university research farms, but this is the first time an apple has been taken through taste tests and focus groups before introduction. The audience data assured processors and wholesalers there is a market for the new apple. When a grower is, is deciding to plant a new variety, feel only so comfortable with taking on a huge amount of risk with a new investment. The good thing about this sort of situation is that that risk gets spread out through a whole industry. So more emphasis can be put on to everyone collaborating and having their own orchards of this new variety so that there will be a huge amount of volume rather than a small amount trickling into the market over a long period of time. The apple breeding program at Washington State University developed WA38 over 20 years, winnowing down an initial group of 40 favorable varieties to two that had commercial potential, WA2 and WA38. A crunchy and juicy apple, WA38 was more grower friendly than Honeycrisp, which is prone to rot, mildew, and sunburn in the field and possesses a thin skin that leads to punctures and bruising during processing. Leaving half of a Honeycrisp crop in the orchard is a common occurrence. Cosmic Crisp avoids most of these issues and brings new advantages to the industry. Outside the orchard, the apple stores for 12 months without special measures like a low oxygen atmosphere and is extremely slow to brown once cut. So from a consumer perspective, really, it's just a great eating apple. You know, I mean, ultimately, that's what the consumer wants. Um, uh, most consumers key in on textural traits initially, and Cosmic Crisp is crisp, obviously, uh, hence the name. It's also extremely juicy, and so it's one of those really nice apples that gives you that fantastic mouthfeel and the refreshing kind of juiciness that you get with, with an ultra-crisp uh, apple type. Dozens of varieties some heirloom, some hybrid, are grown by individual orchards for the specialized apple market for audiences that prefer something unique. The potential of Cosmic Crisp encouraged the researchers at Washington State University to bring the entire supply chain to the table for the rollout of the new apple variety. We've created a marketing advisory board made up of all of the, the main sales and marketing groups. And once they got on board, they felt compelled to get behind this. Exclusivity helped bring growers on board. Cosmic Crisp will only be grown in Washington for 10 years to give growers time to recoup their investment before the variety goes global. The apple breeding program at Washington State will see a revenue stream to fund future research by charging a dollar per tree start and 4.5 percent of the wholesale sales of Cosmic Crisp apples grown in the state of Washington. Cosmic Crisp harvests in what is typically Red Delicious season. So many growers have been looking for something that will replace Red Delicious in terms of, of their harvest portfolio. It is expected that Red Delicious trees, a variety that sees 85 percent of the U.S. crop exported internationally, will be the first to be replaced with Cosmic Crisp with other older varieties like Cortland and Brayburn to also lose acreage. The goal is to join Gala, Fuji, Granny Smith, Golden Delicious, and Honeycrisp as the apples Americans most consume.
Grower and packer interest is expected to make the rollout of Cosmic Crisp the fastest the industry has ever seen. The last major apple variety to be introduced, Pink Lady, required 15 years to reach 1 million trees in the ground. Cosmic Crisp is expected to double that number in only two years. Interest in Cosmic Crisp has been so strong that a form of lottery was held to parcel out the initial tree starts. Few orchards got as many as they wanted, but most got enough for a dedicated section of their orchard. Roughly 700,000 trees were grafted in 2017, with another 1.3 million planned for 2018, making it the largest apple tree introduction ever. Cosmic Crisp apples should begin to appear in West Coast markets in 2019 and expand nationally in 2020. If you want to talk about the old Red Delicious and where that went and, and its sellability through the state of Washington way back 30 years ago, this is the new Red Delicious, but, you know, 10 times better. Growing the better apple won't come cheap. Converting an orchard to a new variety like Cosmic Crisp can cost $35,000 per acre. Using high-density trellis systems, less than 1,500 acres statewide will be needed to start 2 million trees, but at a cost to growers of over $40 million. Time will tell if consumers will find room for this new apple in their shopping carts. From Market to Market, I'm Peter Tubbs. We'll take a short break, but coming up on our Farm Week feature, we've got a nutty story for you. The pecan industry is cracking new markets. Thanks to international interest, prices have exploded. In fact, prices are so good, some farmers are clearing out other crops to make way for the precious pecan. Whether you say it pecan or pecan or some other way, one thing's for sure, there's a payday going on right now. That's coming up on Farm Week, but first, this important word about Mississippi homemaker volunteers. Don't go away. My mom was the one that got me into homemakers. And I just thought, Lordy, that's such a neat thing. I, I want to be one of those ladies doing all those good things for the community and stuff. We do a cooking at church and like a community mission thing. We have kids that come in every Wednesday night and we cook for them. Sewing, you know, from the hospital making the blankets from the area pillowcases. We make dresses and we send them overseas. And to me, that's a great mission, but it's also a great giving back to the community. All the things that you do for all these people is like love that you, that's comes back to you. You can't value it at money or time because it's all right here in your heart what it does to you. I think the Lord wants us to do for other people and that's what we do. That's what we're here for. ATVs are a ton of fun for people of all ages, but these powerful machines can also be a ton of trouble if safety guidelines aren't followed. Always wear a regulation helmet, gloves, and goggles when operating a four-wheeler. Long sleeves, pants, and over-the-ankle boots are also smart protection. Mississippi law requires approved ATV safety training for all operators who don't have a driver's license. This message brought to you by MSU Extension 4-H. Pecan pie is a tradition too. Turns out that the pecan business is actually one segment of the market doing pretty well. Prices are up and even brand new farmers are getting into the business. Once again, here's Colleen Bradford Krantz. Only almonds surpass these nuts when it comes to U.S. acres dedicated to production. Yet growers say many Americans are unable to identify them. A couple years ago, we went to a show up in New York for wholesale, and I'd say one out of every four people that came by said, oh, walnuts. And you say, well, no, not really, actually, it's pecan. Um, and so there's a lot of work to do domestically. However, enthusiasm outside the U.S., particularly in China, has grown rapidly in the past decade. While domestic consumption of the shelled version has remained relatively steady, increasing nearly 5% between 1997 and 2017, the export volume has grown 460% over the same period. 
That international interest and the resulting price surge have led to an expansion in pecan growing regions of the United States. Georgia, the largest pecan producing state, has seen roughly 5,000 acres added each year since 2011. The pecan prices uh, have uh, exploded uh, and that in turn has led to a huge increase in uh, interest in pecans. Our acreage is growing rapidly. Pecan producers are optimistic about giving the domestic market a boost as they have, after several failed attempts, approved a federal marketing order allowing self-funded promotion of their product. The plan, launched in the aftermath of China implementing increased tariffs against the industry, includes the new marketing slogan, American Pecans, the original super nut. Those trying to recruit new fans don't care so much how consumers pronounce the name of the antioxidant-rich nut as long as they look beyond the Thanksgiving pie. The nut that we grow is a pecan, and some people say pecan, some people say pecan, and some people say pecan. And I am bound by my marriage vows to, to say pecan. My wife has, has really revolted at pecan, thinking that that's um, something that was put beside the bed in olden days. USDA reports the nation had 392,700 acres of nut-bearing pecan trees as of 2017. University of Georgia Extension experts estimate that 40% of the nation's pecan acres are in the peach state. However, the data reveals it isn't peach production that has been trimmed back to make way for more pecans. Much of the land we see going into uh, pecan production is coming from row crop fields where they were growing cotton. We also see um, where people have been growing pine trees. Uh, we see a lot of that being cleared. Alex Wilson, a fourth generation grower working his family's Sunnyland Farms in Albany, says the increased interest from China was a game changer. As China began buying more U.S. pecans, the average U.S. price of all pecans grew from $1.12 per pound in 2007 to $2.59 a pound in 2016, an increase of 131 percent. My father likes to use a story that, and I forget the exact year, in 2006 or 2007, we had our best crop ever. And then four or five years later, we made basically half as many pecans and sold them for overall more dollars. The Chinese really enjoy the hickory nut. The hickory nut uh, apparently had uh, some issues with, with quality and production uh, a few years ago. Pecan's actually a member of the hickory family. They used it that year, and, and since then the demand has stayed pretty heavy. The Chinese still prefer it in shell. They see it kind of as a, a communal, like let's crack some pecans and discuss. Um, but that's the older generation, you know, after going over to China a couple different times, you know, you, you notice that the younger generation is actually more interested in a finished product. Farther north in Fort Valley, Georgia, another fourth generation producer, Al Pearson of Pearson Farm, watched as the area's market forces shifted when the Chinese began to buy directly from farmers who had previously sold to shellers the shellers were forced to compete with the Chinese buyers. What that did was open up a market for the farmer to supply the end user with the end shell pecans versus going to a sheller. So their entry into the market raised the price and the value of the, of the end shell pecan, tightened up the market for the domestic shelling operations. As all of this played out, others began to take note. New growers invested the $2,200 per acre to plant pecan trees, trees they knew would not produce a full crop for seven to nine years. A recent pecan producers meeting and pruning clinic in Wilcox County, Georgia, had nearly 60 attendees, where in past years there might have been a few dozen. We see a lot of new people getting in uh, to the pecan business right now. It may range anywhere from, uh, you know, people who are retiring and wanting to move back to their uh, farm, family farm, or uh, people who buy a little plot of land and want to try to grow something. Um, 
all the way up to uh, large investment groups. Dixie Hudson, who grew up helping with her family's pecan orchards, had a small pecan grove of 17 trees, but she nearly doubled its size when prices climbed. My few trees that I have pay my property taxes. I have a nice little Christmas, and uh, you know I'm helping people get started. Maybe they'll make $2,000 next year on their pecans. Well, that was $2,000 more than they had last year. Hudson and other new growers, waiting anxiously for their new trees to begin producing, are betting on an increase in loyalty at home to counterbalance potential losses in Chinese market share. For Market to Market, I'm Colleen Bradford Krantz. Interesting to see an entire industry become so elastic. Certainly is. The crops go where the money is. Don't Absolutely. They? <laughs> As they should. Well, next week, uh, with New Year's soon on the way, we'll have a story about beer for you. There are more than 6,000 brewers responsible for at least 20,000 beer brands in the U.S. alone, all part of an exploding craft beer brewing industry. But one of the main ingredients in all that beer, hops, is in constantly fluctuating demand. How do you stay afloat with wild price swings for all kinds of reasons? That's next time on Farm Week. Remember, if you miss the story, look for the past episodes of Farm Week at our website, farmweek.tv. And don't forget to follow us on Facebook and Twitter as well. We'll see you next week. Merry Christmas.